So we're going to not necessarily finish this. Uh, we've been talking for the last month since it's been February on marriage and the relationship that we have with our loved ones. But we're going to be continuing this throughout the whole uh, year a little bit off and on. But we're going to stop this, uh, this section right now. And we're going to be dealing with basically how to fight fair. And, uh, you know, there's so many good books on this. Uh, one of them that I enjoy, in all honesty, is by Tim and Joy Downs. And these guys are uh, active in, uh, in stuff like uh, Focus on the Family and also uh, We Get to Remember. And this is called Fight Fair. And here's a guy that says, Winning at Conflict Without Losing at Love. It's a good, good book. I personally like it because of the cartoons, which I will scan in next week, and then we'll go through some of these as we recap and finish this whole thing. But this is a very good book, and it has a little bit on us. It's a, it's a, it's a book for guys, if you men will understand that, because it has all these uh, uh, power little points. That you just uh, okay, I don't have to read all 120 pages, 100, 150 pages. But uh, I could read just this one page and I could get the major point. So it's really a, a guy-friendly uh, uh, book, you know, what I mean. Uh, so uh, before I go through that, just uh, there's some uh, real good stuff inside your uh, bulletin. One of them in the very bottom says, do you want to improve your marriage? We highly recommend a week entry member. You could Google Family Life or week entry member for the dates and the times. This is a fun two and a half day getaway for couples. And remember, our church will pay for 50% uh, for this if you go. And uh, you just come and talk to me before you go, then we'll get it all straightened out. So uh, that's the goal. Uh, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Okay? Chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And we're starting off with this section in Ephesians chapter 4, basically because I have seen and been part of in my younger years uh, of not, um, this is to my shame, this is not a uh, proclamation, I have not kept this as I should have in my younger years, but definitely as I finish my race and get closer to uh, going home with the Lord, or as my friends say, graduating. I want this to be part of my life. This is what Ephesians chapter 4 says. It says, uh, verse 29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. This is really important. Now notice it says, don't let any unwholesome word proceed. Now, I, I've told many a joke about my loving brother, and I'll tell another one for those who forget. My loving brother was rather rotund, okay? Our last name, Delgado, means thin or slender. It can't even mean skinny. So you can tell that, I, I would say this to, to Jesus, my friend here, Jesus, soy delgado, Jesus, I am Delgado. I'm, my name is Delgado. But, no soy. But I am not. <laughs> okay? I am not thin. I am not skinny. But that's my last name. Now, my brother would tell me in his sarcastic way, you know, now he's, you, know, you have to understand, he's a big guy. He goes to me and he says, You've gotten fat. Now, it's true. I weighed 125 pounds, no questions today. I, I weighed 125 pounds when I got married, and my wonderful wife has invested heartily into me. Okay? And so, 5, 10 pounds every year, you do the math. I've been now married almost 30 years, and ta-da, you know, here I am. So, uh, so, you know, so, so what do I say to my brother? He says, you're fat. I go as a brother would sometimes do, as I do, unfortunately, I say, you're ugly, and I could lose weight. <laughs> you know? Now, that is an unwholesome word. True, but unwholesome. You know? It's just not nice. 
Now, the Bible tells us that in this context, in our idea of marriage, that in relationship, whether you're married or not, it says, don't let any unwholesome word proceed from suwokasum from your mouth. Don't let it come out. But give a word of edification. Now, we don't use this word very often. At least I don't. I don't know. Maybe you hang with people who talk like, that sermon was very edifying to me. You know, I don't hear that, you know. Maybe it's because I hear you guys and it's not edifying. But the word edifying means to build up. Okay? So the idea is, but give a word that builds people up, that encourages, that lifts them up. Okay? And he says, give this word as though it is the right word at the right time. This is really important. Proverbs, I read the Proverbs, I try to read it every day. There's 31 days, so I have to catch up a little bit more because I want to get through the book of Proverbs in the month of February, and there's only 28 days, so I have to, you know, those last three or four days, I have to double up. But you read Proverbs, and one of the things you find out in the book of Proverbs, it says, He who blesses his neighbor in the morning, to him it shall sound like a curse. Now, have you ever tried to sleep in, whatever that means to you, and then the next person next to you or next door says, Good morning! That I do. You know, it's like, don't do that. So listen to the edification, the word at the right time. Okay? So that it will bring your hearers blessings. Now, the... the, the Proverbs is filled with these good, pithy sayings, like uh, a proverb in a mouth of a fool is like smoke to the eyes or vinegar to the teeth. You know? It's like somebody who's saying, who's always late. You're always late. They go, you're late one time. What does this person say? The early bird catches a worm. You know? <laughs> no. You use the word, whatever God's word has, as you build it up. But then, in the context of fighting fair, now, the fact is, if you're in any type of relationship, you are going to have some disagreements. It's just the way it is. Okay? But part of this is learning how to value your disagreements without devaluing the other person. Does that make sense? I could disagree with you, but that does not mean I should disrespect you. It means I could disagree with your politics, but I can love you anyway. This last week I saw a friend. She is a lesbian. Her partner was with her. I went up to her partner, who I happen to know, gave them both a hug, tell them I was glad to see them, asked them how they were. I disagree with their lifestyle. They know this. They know I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. They know that from my perspective, they are aberrant in their relationship. Okay? But I love them and I want the best for them. Does that make sense? Do, do you know what I'm saying? Okay, so you tell them, you edify them, and in the name of Jesus, you confront them at the appropriate time. But God's word also says, look, first of all, you are to hear. What does the Bible say in the section of uh, Santiago, of James? James chapter 1, this is a very good verse to memorize. It says, but let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the what? The righteousness of God. Now, Covey, uh, Stephen Covey, when he wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he sort of took this verse and he mixed it up in his own way and he said basically this, Seek first to understand, then, or seek first to understand, then to be understood. Okay? So the idea is, I want to understand where you're coming from before I present my reasoning. Okay? At work, I get the privilege of doing all sorts of 
helping people communicate. Communication is really hard. I was talking to uh, one of the head people of the organization called um, Nurse, let's see, uh, Oregon, ONA, uh, Oregon Nursing Association. And I go to her and I, we're talking and I said, so in, in, in the union talk with the administration, whatever, and this is the whole Southern Oregon, I said, what's the biggest conflict? What's the biggest uh, point of problem? And she, without, without stopping, she said, communication. Yeah. She says, we want sort of the same thing, but the way we get to it gets crazy. From a scriptural perspective, God is saying, first of all, be slow to what? Speak. Notice, notice the anatomy that God has made for all of us is very, very telling. How many ears do we have? Two ears. I don't know about you. Maybe he needs to learn. Anyway, I have two ears, okay? I have how many mouths? One. Perhaps I should listen twice as much as I should be. Thank you, my son. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Listen first. I have such a frustration. My sons understand this. I go, Ugh! Tell me what you learned. Tell me what's the takeaway. And I try to listen. And they go. No. When you get angry, you go. Then they go. Then they go and say, I don't know. No that. Now, you know, you, you got to listen. But listening is tough. As a matter of fact, you guys know this colloquialism in the United States. We say people have, oftentimes are said to have, speak with silver tongues. But silence is always what? Golden. Sometimes the best thing to say is, you know what I mean? It's hard. Do you guys remember watching that video about, it's not about the nail? <laughs> Huh? What did the guy have to do? Nothing. Well, he wanted to fix the lady who had the nail in the head, right? But you, no, 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 you always try to fix it. What? Just listen. He had to listen. It's hard. Now, this is, we talk a lot about women having pink colored lenses and pink colored hearing aids and pink colored megaphones and they talk pink. Okay? Now, this is not my wife, but I know many women who do this. Okay? They go to the closet, oftentimes a walk-in closet, and they go, I have nothing to wear. <laughs> right? Now, a guy, now what does that mean for a woman? Now, I know, this is thin ice, ladies. It's probably why there's more guys here than not. Women. women tend to mean, when they say this, I don't have anything new. Generally. Okay? When guys say, they call up their friends and go, Man, I don't got anything to wear. And you know what the guy says? She doesn't wash her clothes either, huh? Sit up. See, a guy, when he says he doesn't have anything to wear, usually means it's not that he doesn't have anything new, it's just that it's stinky and dirty. Okay? Yeah, they're the same words. Girls, women tend to have a different worldview, different lenses of guys. Do, do, is this correct then? Do I, do I hear sort of a, oh, okay, that's good. Enough. Okay, but you see, well, We'll talk more about hair with women later. But the fact is that girls have a different idea than guys. They, 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 praise God they're different. Viva la difference. 
you know? But from a scriptural point of view, the commandment is still that we are both to be quick to hear and slow to speak. I use this at work. Fault of communication. I was working once working on the car, changing the brakes, trying to change the brakes and changing the, the, uh, the air out of the brakes. I was bleeding the brakes by myself and I had this little squirty thing and this kid, oh, I mean, it's, you, it's, I don't know how you do it, Jesus, but it's, it's really a two-man job, at least for me, okay? And so, you know, I'm doing this stuff and I have, I have gunk all over me, I'm underneath the car and... And Janet had been working on dinner or lunch or something like that. And she said, this was when Timothy or Paul were really little. And she sent them out to go get me to come to eat. She says, go tell your dad dinner's ready. Okay? And I'm, I'm going to dad, dinner's ready. Come and eat. Okay? I don't even remember who the kid was. I said, not now. What? He goes back. And he says something like, not now. He doesn't say not now. He says, he doesn't want any. Oh, man. <laughs> now, how did my wife feel? Okay, she worked. She wanted to. She, and when she said dinner was ready, what did she mean? She meant come and eat. Right? It's hot. I worked. Da, 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 da. What did I mean? When I said, not now. Not ready. Did it mean that I disrespected my wife? Did it mean that I didn't care for her? Did it mean that I wasn't hungry? No. It meant that right now was not a good time because I was filthy and I still needed to bleed the brakes because what would have happened if had I just left it? The air would have gone back in and you know, all you guys know what happens, okay? So, she gets her hurt feelings. I know I'm in the doghouse. She comes out. And then she sees what I'm doing, and she goes, oh. Right? See, there was some communication, but the faulty area of the communication was this little kid. Okay? Wasn't her fault, wasn't my fault. We'll blame it on the kid. <laughs> but there's a miscommunication. So, to be first hearing, be quick to hear. What you say versus what you mean, what you thought I meant to say. Oh, man. I was telling my wife this, this last night, or uh, this morning. I was coming home, and uh, this nurse is leaving just about the same time, and we meet at the elevator. Okay? And I start to laugh. And she says, what are you laughing at? And I said, well, I've known this nurse for 15 years. I've known her husband. And I go, I was going to say, let's go home together. Now, that's not what I said. Because it sounds wrong for the chaplain to talk to a nurse. Let's go home together. I said, but I checked myself, and I was meant to say, oh, we're going home at the same time. <laughs> Big difference. She's going to her home, to her husband. I'm going to my home, to my wife. You see, communication is really important. You have to stop sometimes. We as men and women need to stop and say, how am I communicating this? I am bad at this a lot of times. I am terrible. For some reason, the mouth gear, Jesus, maybe I need transmission work on my brain. The mouth gear gets in connection before the brain does. And things come out where I go, whoa, that didn't come out right. Does anybody else have those types of problems? Oh, I, I know you do because I hear you. Jeremiah, please sit down. Okay, thank you. But let's look at this. This is the key for marriage, guys and gals. This and the next verse. Verse 33 of Ephesians chapter 5. It's in your bulletin if you don't know where the Ephesians is. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. It says, Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife even as himself. And let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. Ladies, you may not know this, but let me tell you about your guy. 
your, your husband, they don't need the love that you want. You as a woman need love. But what men long for is respect. I've talked to this about this for many, with many, many men, and the big problems, and there's even a very good book by uh, Egridge uh, about the, the, the love cycle, I think it is. Is that correct? Um, and, and it talks about this crazy cycle. What happens is that if you could imagine a circle, circle okay? And over here it's love. And over here is respect. Got that? So love, respect. This is the title for this. Her needs, and it's love. His needs, respect. She doesn't respect him. She acts in a disrespectful way. She doesn't necessarily understand it's disrespectful, but he feels disrespected. So what does he do? He closes down. She needs what? Love. But he's closed down. So what does she do? She just respects him more. And it gets crazier, 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 and crazier. And pretty soon, boom, 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 down the toilet. To break this crazy cycle, one of the two, either the man or the woman, have to come to the point where we're saying, if it's the woman, she says, she needs to say, sweetheart, did I somehow, did you feel disrespected when I said something? Or the guy needs to say, sweetheart, I love you. I maybe felt a little disrespected, but I love you. And what happens is that breaks the cycle, and then she, because she knows she is loved by the man, she can offer respect and admiration. Not because he's the great, you know, whatever, but because that's how God has made us. And for, I see this all the time, and about 80% of my marriage counseling deals with this whole issue of lack of love or lack of respect. God has put it here. And you see, in marriage counseling in the last, last 20 years or so, the whole push has been love, love, love. All we need is love, you know, baloney. What we need is a balanced approach of what God wants. And that's why he says, look, love and respect. And, and make sure you love her like you love yourself. That you respect him. Because not who he is or what he does, but because God has made him the man who is your does this make sense? See, I'll tell you, I, I'll tell a story. I was talking to one of the nurses. We had a, a suicide attempt uh, at the hospital, and uh, this is what I was talking to this nurse about a similar suicide attempt. It's a sad situation. This Christian lady went to her hairdresser because she was having problems. And in this hair salon, there were four, this is not a joke, this is true. I don't have to make this stuff up. There were four hair salonists, is that how you call them? Whatever. These people who do their ladies' hair. And she went to each one of them after every month talking to them about her marital problems. I was I, talking to the nurse about this. She goes, yeah, it's really interesting. Anytime somebody touches your hair, you tell them the whole story. That's weird. Okay? But she goes and she tells this, this hair salon lady her problems. And so one hair salon lady says, well, you should do this. And then the other one, and that didn't work. The other one says, do that. That didn't work. The other one, and finally the last one says, just withhold your child. Oh, that really helped out. You know what happened? The husband said, that's it. He got a lawyer to took the kid away. She attempted suicide. So I'm talking to her, to, to the patient. I said, tell me, what got you in this situation? She told me the story. I said, are you a Christian? She goes, yes. I said, did you ever go to see your pastor? Did you ever seek what the Bible said? She goes, uh, no. Does the Bible say anything about this? 
The world gives you all sorts of crazy things. Now, you have a choice. You have a choice. This is the proposal. You have the choice. You could go ahead and get uh, insight and wisdom from Oprah. Okay? That's your choice. You could get what Cosmo says about it. It's your choice. My proposition to you is go to the Bible. Figure out what God says about being equally yoked. See how the Bible says to be, to be the man who loves the woman who's willing to die for her, who dies to himself so that she could have the fullness of the blessing of God. And that because the man is the man that God has called him to be, she is able to respect his efforts. So, what do you think? You have a choice. See, this is not a brainwashing session. This is an honest-to-goodness opportunity for you to stop and say, hmm, I've been trying X, Y, and Z on my marriage for the last X amount of years. Or maybe your marriage has failed. Or maybe you've just been messy and don't even know have a good relationship. And maybe you've been trying to do stuff on your own. That's where you are. The proposition is, Consider what God has to say for you about relationship. Does that make sense? And when you give yourself, your broken, heartbroken self, to Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again, it says, if any man, the idea is any person, not the gender issue, if anyone be in Christ, behold, the, the word is, is, is like the word ta-da. Ta-da! Behold, he is a new creature. All the things, that brokenness, is gone away. It's transformed. The word is actually metamorphosized. It's been transformed, and you have become a new creature. Now, maybe you come from a broken home. Maybe your mom and dad were not the pristine role models of what a good marriage is. Maybe your mom or your dad was bad and not repentant and just needs Jesus Christ. Maybe that's the way you lived it. You cannot change the past. But do you know that when you give your past to Jesus Christ, He takes that brokenness and He brings healing. You know what? I love my father, respect him, but as a dad, as a husband, in some ways, he failed. And I had the choice to become like him, and many times I am fortunately like him, and sometimes unfortunately like him. But as I learned and matured to become the man that God has wanted me to be, and learned from the Holy Scriptures of what God has called me to be here. I have learned to, instead of being one way like my dad, to say, Lord, I'm broken in this area. Help me become more like you. See? And my wife, God bless her, she has become more like the Lord Jesus. And so, does our, do, do we have problems in our home? Yes. Is there miscommunication? Yes. But do you know that there's a love that is stronger because of Jesus? Now, I cannot change your past. I cannot change your brokenness. I cannot. I have no control of your future. But I offer you this. Give your life to Jesus. Give your relationships to Jesus. Give your future to Jesus and say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender all. You have control of my life, the life of my kids, the life of my grandkids. God, we're all broken. Bring healing. 
And when you do that, he hears, he listens, and he provides. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come with the simple message of knowing that we are broken. And asking you to heal the heartaches of our soul. We pray that you would draw us close to you. And as we are drawn closer to you as a man and a woman, as a husband and a wife, that under that, that love relationship, united in Jesus, you will empower our families to draw closer to you. Help us to love, not only in word, but in action. And that our love for our spouses would be magnified by your Spirit. Lord, we know this is impossible on our own strength. We ask that you would strengthen us. And that your love would be, would be made perfect through our attempts. Help us to stand aside and let your love shine through us instead of in spite of us. Pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, maybe you need some help with your marriage. If you do, or maybe you know somebody who needs help, please fill out this uh, New Horizon Connection card. Put whatever your prayer request is on the back, and I will pray. I will try to contact you. You can do a lot of this stuff yourself. Our church has all sorts of supplies to help you help other people. You don't have to have your act together in your marriage to be a marriage supporter. All you need to do is be the conduit and help us help your loved ones who are having heartaches in their because Jesus wants our homes to be dedicated to Him. We're going to collect the offering. If you're a guest, you don't have to give. We're not here after your money. Jesus is after your home. So I'm going to have Don come collect this offering, and uh, we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to be dismissed. <laughs>